morning is found in Numbers chapter 13, verses 25 through 33. This is when the Israelites, they send, it, they send in a group of spies into the promised land to see, uh, to see what's up and uh, to see what God has for them. Numbers. 13, verses 25 through 33. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran and Cave. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong. And the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of Indonesia. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to, over we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it were of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Amakites come from the Nephilim. And to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. May the Lord richly bless this reading of his holy word. Amen. I can still remember Bishop Irons using this text and preaching it at my ordination. The title of this morning's message is Wanderings, Israel on a Road Trip. Our theme this morning is God will bless us in the desert. What does this passage mean for us today? How, how does it affect us? How do we survive and even thrive in the desert? God customizes deserts for each of us. Joseph, when he was in jail. Moses, in the desert of Midian for 40 years before this experience. Moses was in the desert by himself in Midian for 40 years. David runs from Saul in the desert. His character is built in the desert. Jesus begins his ministry in the desert. A desert can be almost anything. A child gone astray. Or a lost child. Trouble. A disease, a relationship, a condition, a difficult loss, a sin, or foolishness that leads us the wrong way. Desert equals difficult situation that we can't solve by ourselves. How do we live better lives? How do we live lives of faith? How do we engage rather than disengage with the Lord in such circumstances? How do we hold on to God's word and face the reality of our situation? The Israelites give us a good, bad example of how not to do this. It's like watching an elder brother or sister when you're a little kid being punished. You kind of know what not to do if you're paying attention. Israel's three complaints to Moses. They complain, Numbers 11 and 12. I hope you're tracking this in the story. Israel's three complaints to Moses. Hardships of the trip. Why did you even make us leave Egypt? Of course, they were slaves back there. Israel complains about the food every day. Manna, morning, noon, and night. Now, we need to have a little empathy for the Israelites. I've changed my diet recently, and I am so sick of carrots right now. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh. And 
I have other foods I can eat. They ate manna morning, noon, and night. Interesting thing happens. Miriam and Aaron complain about Moses being the leader. This is right in the Bible. You know what they do, though? They attack Mrs. Moses. They don't have the guts to go after Moses. So they go after the next best thing. They go after his wife. Pretty early in Scripture when this happens. Now, I want to say playfully that Mrs. Moses had put Moses through seminary. But that's poetic license. Here's what the Bible says. Mrs. Moses had saved Moses' life and his ministry. She had stepped into the gap to perform a very important task that Moses had overlooked in his ministry. He forgot to circumcise his own kid. And God has an issue with him about it. And Moses can't do anything because he's stricken. And Mrs. Moses takes a knife in hand and does the right thing and gets the job done. Saves Moses' life, saves Moses' ministry. And Miriam and Aaron are now going after her throat because she's different from them. Wasn't raised in the church. Wasn't raised in their, in their exact family. And I guess she, I guess they thought maybe she should be different because she was a cushion. But that's who she was. <clears throat> to their peril, Miriam and Aaron attack this saint of God. And either one or two things are going on. Either they didn't know about this, because you never have all the facts on somebody else. Or they forgot about it. Kind of had a, what have you done for me lately attitude. And Miriam, God calls Moses, Miriam, and Aaron and says, uh, come in, let's talk. And reveals this whole thing to Moses. And from this, Miriam gets leprosy. And Moses prays on her behalf so that she may be delivered. This was brought up in Sunday school last week because it's hard to do this whole text justice without going into further study. Without further study. It's hard to really do this text justice, which is why it's wonderful to study. And one of my Mrs. Moses' favorite lines is, Complain, remain. Praise be raised. There was a lot of complaining going on. And when you're complaining, ugh. And you can complain in the Lord. There are a lot of songs that will help you to do it. You can do that. But ultimately, God has some better places for us to go. So Israel has three complaints to Moses. Why just this Moses guy? This food is terrible. And why do we even leave slavery in the first place? Israel takes a dangerous wrong turn at Kadesh Barnea. Nelson, would you put up Kadesh Barnea? We'll just hold there for a second. Twelve spies, a man from each tribe, are sent to surveil the promised land. Ten spies report about the abundance of the land and also the giants who live there. And they, they come back and say, we cannot take the land. However, there's a minority report. Caleb and Joshua give a minority report. They say the same thing, but they conclude, because God is with us, we can take the land. So Moses takes the minority report, urges the people to trust God, and take the land. The people rebel and refuse to obey. Say, no, that ain't happening. The wrong turn takes place at Kadesh Barnea which is located on the edge of the promised land. Moses, in Numbers 14, 28 through 34, reports God's heavy-duty judgment on the people's lack of faith. It is heavy-duty. They're going to find Kadesh Barnea up there, and they're going to end up going back into the wilderness, wander around, and 40 years later, they're going to end up right where they started. Because of God's judgment. Doesn't wipe them out. Moses talks to God about that. 
So 40 years they're going to be in the wilderness, and the people who said it's too much, we can't do it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy for them. That will be their case. After 40 years, they end up where they began. Kadesh Barnea. Third movement. Moses gives a grand valedictory speech. Aaron's dead now. Okay? This slowest speech guy really has developed into quite a speaker through the help of the Lord. He gives to them a speech which I can sum up in two words. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. But unfortunately, Moses has gotten himself into some trouble too. God says to Moses, let's pretend this altar's a rock. Moses said, God says to Moses, Moses, speak to the rock and have water come out. Moses doesn't speak to the rock. Instead, he takes his staff and he says, what do I have to do? Do I have to hit this rock to make water come out? And the water comes out. Moses does not give God glory. He makes it look like he brought the water out of the rock. And not God. It's like, with those two taps, he's saying, I'm doing this. And God says, that's going to cost you your trip to the promised land. I'm going to let you look at it. But you're not going in with your people. Wow. Moses tells the people that they have a fresh opportunity to trust and obey God, who is the divine GPS. <clears throat> Moses tells the people they are not alone. God is with them. Today, we are called to choose life. God takes everyone he loves through a desert. What's so cool about the desert? Our idols die in the desert. The Yankees needed more than $200 million to win. It's the nature of life. Our wills in the desert, our wills are broken in the reality of our circumstances. We don't. Which side our bread needs to be buttered on? We realize that God is the only game in town. We realize that we need God. That man does not have the answer. That a formula does not have the answer. That you just can't, you know, go do three things and you're, and you're done. We realize that God is the only game in town. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we cry out to God so often and so long that there's a channel that begins to develop between us and God. It's called a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior. Isn't that cool? That you're in such a desolate place that you know that you know that you need God. And that in that circumstance, in that situation, you and God start to have a relationship like Moses had with God. You have a living relationship with God. And it's cool. To live successfully in the desert, we begin to realize that we're part of a story greater than ourselves. In the desert, people of faith, you know what happens? We move from bitter to wait. There's a difference between bitter and waiting. Bitter, you know, you fold your hands and I prayed three times already, haven't heard. And you know something? We all live there sometimes. Let's be honest. We move in the desert when we choose faith, when we choose life. We move from bitter to waiting. We move from anger to watching. Now, sometimes we need to begin with anger. It's okay. Read the Bible. The Bible's full of anger. It's often the beginning and middle of the story. It's not the end of the story. We move from anger to watching. We move from aimless to wondering. 
We move from cynical to praying. We move from controlling, this must be done my way. I told you how you were going to heal me. We move from controlling to submitting. God heals a lot of ways. We move from hopeless to hoping. We move from thankless to thankful. And here's a big one. We move from blaming to repenting. Repenting means change. <laughs> change me, Lord. I didn't see it that way before. Might there be another angle on this? Might there be another way to look at this? A good life story, a good choose life story, has four elements. A teachable character, <clears throat> teachable character, on a mission from God, with struggle. The story won't make any sense unless you're strong in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it means staying up half the night to study for the test or the right to pay. Anything good I've ever written has always come with struggle. Where you get writer's block. You say, Jesus, I need your help. And he helps. And the fourth part of a good story is a happy ending, a resolution. In the desert, choose life. In life, choose life. In the desert, here's my theme this morning, in the desert. I won't let go, Jesus, until you bless me. I'm not going to let go of you. I'm not going to let go of you, Jesus Christ, until you bless me. There's a word from the Lord this morning. Choose life. And in fact, you have a little card in your, um, in your bulletin. And I signed one already. It does take guts to leave the ruts. It says God's journey for you. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and holding fast to Him. Uh, today, if you'd like to re-up, sign the card. Or up. Let's pray again. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for our big brothers and sisters, the Israelites, for their wandering in the desert. We learned so much from them, Lord. And we pray that you bless them and honor them. And Lord, help each of us on our journey with you to choose life. Help us, Jesus Christ, to choose life. To not let go of you until you bless us. We lift up our eyes under the heavens, and when it comes to our help, our help comes from you, Lord. You make heaven and earth. It is in your name we pray, and all God's people say. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Please stand.